As followers of Jesus Christ, we are gathered to worship and confess our beliefs. We believe that the Bible, as originally written, was God-breathed, both verbally and in every part. 
It is the final authority of our faith and lifestyle. We believe in one God, the creator of heaven and earth, that in the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life, died and rose from the dead, ascended bodily into heaven, and is coming again to rapture his saints and establish his kingdom. We believe that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, equal with the Father and the Son and of the same nature. We believe man was created by the direct act of God and not from a previously existing form of life. By voluntary transgression, he fell from his state of innocence. Consequently, all men are now sinners by nature and by choice. We believe salvation of sinners is divinely initiated, holy of grace, and accomplished only through the majoritorial work of the Son of God. It is not of works or religion. We believe in the local church and the universal church, which is the body of Jesus Christ. We believe water baptism is the single immersion of a believer in water, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to show his identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. It can do nothing for his salvation. We believe that the Lord's Supper is the commemoration of his death until he comes. We believe in the bodily resurrection of the just and the unjust. Believers by faith in Christ will spend eternity in the presence of God, unbelievers in everlasting punishment. We believe that every believer should live for God and separated from the world, and by the aid of the Holy Spirit should walk in Christian love and holiness. We believe that Jesus Christ commands his church to make disciples of every nation. We believe that the greatest thing man can do for himself is to love God above all, and the greatest thing he can do for others is to show them how to love God above all.
For our scripture reading this evening, we'll be reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 down to 18. The word of the Lord says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who, who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Hello, everyone, beloved in the Lord. Welcome to our Betty Seminar, Biblical End Time Events 101. Thank you so much for joining this online class. This is 101 because this is more of a survey, a brief study of end time events. But of course, we can go deep if needed. The theological term for this subject is eschatology, which comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last, end, or final. There are two categories of eschatology, personal and cosmic. Personal eschatology includes topics such as death, intermediate state, resurrection, heaven and hell. This seminar that we have is mainly on cosmic eschatology, and we'll be going through 10 key eschatological events and their practical application for our sanctification. This is scheduled for 10 sessions. Our Zoom seminar format includes a lecture preaching, it's a combination of lecture and preaching. And of course, a Q&A. And most of the time, I am going to use one key passage for each event to also demonstrate expository preaching of a single section of Scripture. Our aim for this seminar is not only for information, but for transformation holy transformation. My prayer that this seminar may help you and me experience more and more the much-needed dose for our sanctification, a powerful prayer uttered by Jonathan Edwards. Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. Amen. May our compassion for the lost intensify as the result of our deepened love for the Lord with our time together. May this redound to our godly rejoicing and to God's global renown. We're going to follow the timeline of biblical end-time events as seen on the slide. Rapture with resurrection, rewarding, reception, retribution, the return or the revelation with resurrection, reign, reckoning with resurrection, rebellion, restoration, and our responsibilities, practical application for sanctification. The rapture is the first to happen among the cosmic end time events. The rapture is also the first stage of the second coming of Christ and it is the instantaneous snatching up of all believers in Christ, dead and alive, before the seven-year tribulation. There are minor and major passages regarding the rapture. The minor ones are Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, 1 Corinthians 1.7, 1 John 3, 2-3, and Revelation 3.10. The major ones are John 14, 2-3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, 1 
and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. Of these three, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 is considered as the most direct and most detailed presentation of the doctrine of the rapture. That is why this is our scripture reading earlier. At this session, we will learn four reasons why we need to value the rapture. Four reasons why we need to value the rapture. First, we need to value the rapture because the rapture is important. We must know it. Look at verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but I do not want you to be ignorant brethren, says Paul. Now, many people, even people from Christian churches, think that eschatology is not that essential kind of doctrine. And I'm here to inform or remind that the Bible is 27% prophetic by nature. That means one out of four verses of the Bible is a prophecy. That is why Apostle Paul opens this section about the rapture by saying in verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. So Paul desires that the believers will have a clear knowledge and understanding of the doctrine of the rapture. We should take note that, that by this time, Thessalonian church is only six months to one year old church, which implies that the doctrine of the rapture is not only for mature believers or for an old church, but it is a foundational doctrine that could greatly help in the growth of believers individually, and of course, as a church, corporately. Rapture is not a minor doctrine. Though a Christian's belief on the rapture, biblical or not, will not affect his justification or entrance to heaven, I'm convinced that having a biblical view of the rapture is important for sanctification. And because sanctification is important, having a right biblical view of the rapture is vital. I would like to mention at this time some paralyzing effects to a Christian or to a church due to ignorance of biblical rapture. The first one, and it's from our text, excessive sorrow, excessive sorrow. I do not want you to be ignorant brethren lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. The believers of Thessalonica were sorrowful because they all thought that Christ would return while everyone is still alive. But they were troubled when some of them died and wonder what will happen to those who died during the rapture. Thus, we have 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 as Paul's response to their concern. And this is Paul's way of comforting the brethren not to be crushed with sadness as if they have no hope. Beloved in the Lord, rapture is a comfort and hope-giving truth. It is sad that in this time of crisis, there are a lot of people who succumbed to depression. And more alarming, even church people are overwhelmed with fear and worries in this time of pandemic. I strongly believe that if vitamin C is helpful in fighting COVID, we Christians need to take vitamin R regularly to fight worries and depression. The question is, has your soul been drinking vitamin R, vitamin rapture, regularly? 
Beloved in the Lord, let us fill our minds with the glorious truth of the rapture. It is spiritual antioxidant. It can surely help build our spiritual immune system, especially in this time of crisis. I will add some more paralyzing effects. I have actually listed at least a total of 10 paralyzing effects. But for lack of time, I will add only two more. Second, date setting of the rapture is another paralyzing effect to a Christian or to a church due to ignorance of biblical rapture. Date setting of the rapture. I remember when I was at West Negros University, there was a Korean preacher who toured around the world campaigning for a second coming prediction that Christ will return October 28, 1992. In fact, one of the advisor of a campus ministry, a faculty at that university, left her ID to a colleague. She was so convinced that there would be no second semester on that school year. And who can forget the craziness of Y2K? It predicted to cause computers meltdown and expected to be the end of the world, right? But Y2K did not result to computers meltdown. Rather, it produced the opposite. Computer-possessed people, the millennials. One of the recent predictions which gained international attention was the 2011 Second Coming Prediction by Harold Camping, a popular radio minister in California, USA. According to his calculation, Christ would come in May 21, 2011. But when May 21 came and nothing happened, he changed it to October 21, 2011, and did other more changes. Do you know how much they spent? for publication, materials, posters, and billboards? Five million dollars. Another paralyzing effect of lack of knowledge of biblical rapture is believing on post-tribulationism that rapture will happen at the end of seven-year tribulation. With this, charts tends to expect more the coming of the Antichrist rather than Christ himself. I don't know if you have noticed this, but this became very popular in this time of pandemic. Isaiah 26, 20. This is one of the most posted verses during this time of pandemic because many thought that this is now, we are now in the tribulation period. Isaiah 26, 20 says, Come, my people, enter your chambers. This is referring to the lockdown. And shut the, your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. When the lockdown is over, Christ will return. I have seven more, but I might mention this during the Q&A. Let's go to the second reason why we need to value rupture and other future end-time events. The second reason is the rupture is incredible. We must be excited for it. That the rupture is incredible means it is a wondrous event with mind-blowing episodes. If you tell this to unbelievers, they might think you're crazy or you're telling them a science fiction story. But biblically, rapture is an event which has incredible and supernatural components. I will highlight five of them based on our studied passage. First incredible component of the rapture, of course, the return of Christ. The return of Christ. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. This is the return of Christ. 
But I would like you to take note that in this return, Jesus Christ will only be up to the air. He will not do the touchdown. He'll do it in the second stage of his second coming. Second incredible component of the rapture, there will be remarkable sounds to summon those who are in Christ. There are three remarkable, glorious sounds that we could hear on that day. Look at the first part of verse 16. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. See that? The first one, descend. the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. It is possible that unbelievers may also hear these sounds, but only believers can understand its meaning and, of course, experience its summoning power. I would also like to say that the trumpet sound here in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is a different trumpet from the trumpet in Matthew 24.31 which will happen at Christ's return at the tribulation, after the tribulation. Third, incredible component of the rapture, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4.16b, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So don't be too sad. Thessalonian believers. Because when a Christian dies, the soul and spirit goes up to the Lord while the body remains on earth. 1 Corinthians 5.8 Absent from the body, but present with the Lord. But on the rapture day, according to verse 14b, Jesus Christ our God will bring down with him the souls of those who sleep in Jesus. For what purpose? To reunite with their bodies. And again, verse 16 says, And the dead in Christ will rise first. The resurrection of the dead is a blessed and magnificent part of the rapture. But of course, to the enemy, it is a hated truth. Have you heard of the missionary who went to the island of Amakusa, Japan. He discovered a grave for Christians. The date of the grave is 1637, in which year the Japanese government ordered all Christians exterminated. And the inscription above this grave states that 11,111 Christians were killed and that their heads and bodies were buried separately to mark the Christian's teaching on resurrection. But of course, they, they thought that by separating the heads from the rest of the bodies in burial, there could, there could be no possibility of the Christians coming forth from their graves. But of course, they're wrong. Why? Because even the cremated bodies of Christians will still be resurrected. There are at least three people who got resurrected in the Old Testament, and there are seven resurrection accounts in the New Testament. And although Jesus Christ is not the first one, Jesus is still the firstborn of the dead, the first fruit of the resurrection, because he is the first who got resurrected and never died again. All people who got resurrected in the Bible died again. But most likely, except with the account in Matthew 27. Can you open your Bibles in Matthew 27? This happened after while Jesus Christ was there on the cross and on his resurrection. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn into from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. 
And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. But look at verse 53. And coming out of the graves after his, after Christ's resurrection. And what did they do? They went into the holy city and appeared to many. Dr. John MacArthur comments on this. Matthew alone mentions this miracle. Nothing more is said about these people, which would be unlikely if they remained on earth for long. Evidently, these people were given glorified bodies. They appeared to many, enough to establish the reality of the miracle. And then they, no doubt, ascended to glory, a kind of foretaste of 1 Thessalonians 4.16. The bodily resurrection of the believers is an important doctrine. I would like to read a comment of Randy Alcorn. Somewhat an alarming reality even among churches. He says of Americans who believe in a resurrection of the dead. Two-thirds believe they will not have bodies after the resurrection. But of course, this is a self-contradictory. A non-physical resurrection is like a sunless sunrise. There's no such thing. Resurrection means that we will have bodies. If we didn't have bodies, we wouldn't be resurrected. End of quote. Our resurrection, beloved in the Lord, is sure because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead. It is very important. As somebody has said, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then nothing in life really matters. But if he did rise from the dead, then nothing else in life really matters matters. Let's go to the fourth incredible component of the rapture. The rapture of the dead and the living believers in Christ. Verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, shall be caught up. The word rapture is the single word for caught up. In the Greek, it is harpazo, which means to take suddenly and vehemently, open with violence and speed, or quickly and without warning. The idea is to take by force with a sudden swoop, and usually indicates a force which cannot be resisted. The Latin translation of this verse used the word rapturo, now, I would like to take note, you to take note that only believers of Christ will be raptured. So if rapture happens tonight, only the believers of Christ, dead in the living, will go up. Will you be raptured? Will you be raptured? There are people in the, new, in the Bible who experience rapture both from Old and New Testaments. We have two in the Old Testament, Enoch and Elijah. In the New Testament, I will mention two. First, we have Philip the Evangelist. In Acts chapter 8, 39, after he baptized the, the eunuch somewhere in Jerusalem, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. This is also harpazo in Greek so that the eunuch saw him no more. Then Philip was found at Azotos. Azotos is 32 kilometers away from where he was snatched away. Can you imagine that? Another person that I will mention who also experienced harpazo is the Apostle Paul himself. Open your Bibles in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I know a man 
in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up. That is our puzzle. Caught up to the third heaven. Paul experienced rapture. And how will we be raptured? Three ways. We will be raptured upwardly. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, not caught down, but caught up. And we will be raptured bodily, not only with our spirit, but bodily. And it can happen while we are alive. It can. We are, it is possible that the rapture will happen while we are alive. Take note of 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Paul says, Then we who are alive, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Paul did not say, Only my spirit and my soul will be caught up, but we. And there will be a generation, beloved in the Lord, a generation of Christians who will never taste death. O Maranatha. Amen. How will we be raptured? We will be raptured upwardly. We will be raptured bodily. And we will also be raptured. By the way, in relation to bodily rapture, open your Bibles in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Of course, this is not the kind of body that will be raptured because according to 1 Corinthians 15, 51, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Referring to living believers. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Bodily rapture. And by the way, this is a mystery according to Apostle Paul that means it has been revealed only in the New Testament time. The rapture is a single testament doctrine. You cannot find it in the Old Testament. And at this time when rapture comes, we will also be raptured not only upwardly, bodily, but also rapidly. That we will be raptured rapidly is consistent with the meaning of the word harpazo or rapture. And also with the fact stated by 1 Corinthians 15.52 that rapture will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment. It is interesting to note that the word moment is taken from the Greek word atomos where we derive the English word atom, which is, of course, basically the smallest unit of ordinary matter that forms a chemical element. Atomos means undivided point of time, rapidly. And at this time, finished or not finished, pass the paper. There will also be a reunion with fellow Christians and with Christ himself. Verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Like, one, like what one pastor said, that the law here on earth is goodbyes, but the law of heaven is reunion. Let's go to the third reason why we should value the rapture. Why we should value the rapture. It is important. It is incredible. And third, the rapture is imminent. We must be prepared for it. Imminent means not near, but next. Imminent means not near, but next. It means it may happen any moment from now. Imminent means that the rapture is a signless event. It has no signs. The second stage of second coming of Christ 
where Christ will set foot on earth has many signs. But rapture has no signs. So don't look for signs. Because the rapture is signless. It may happen any moment from now. And at this time, I'm, I'm going to give you four proofs for the imminent coming of Christ. First, apostles believed the rapture could happen during their lifetime. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And we who are, who are alive and remain, and later Paul added, at the end of this verse, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. He included himself. Meaning, Paul believed that the rapture could happen during his lifetime. And of course, not only Paul believed that, if you would read the writings of John the Beloved, of, of Peter, and of James, they also believed that the rapture could happen during their lifetime. The reality is, beloved in the Lord, we are 2,000 years closer to the rapture. We are 2,000 years closer to the rapture. Another proof for the imminent coming of Christ, the apostles thought rapture will happen before the tribulation. In the context of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, open your Bibles in the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, verse 10, Paul says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Verse 5 and verse 9 are related to the coming of Christ. And when Christ comes, he will deliver us from the wrath to come, which refers to the seven-year tribulation period. And if you would go to the book of Revelation, the rapture verse of the book of Revelation is Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I will save you. I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. The hour of trial refers to the seven-year tribulation period. And please take note of this. The word church or churches are mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. And never from Revelation chapter 4 to 19. The next appearance of the word church is in verse 22. But you can never find a word church or churches in the tribulation section of the book of Revelation. Why? Because the church is, will no longer be during the tribulation. Why? Be, because the church is already snatched up before the tribulation. And therefore, Christians, don't look for the signs. Don't look for Antichrist. Rather, look for Jesus Christ. Amen? There are five views regarding the timing of the rapture relative to the tribulation. And I will quickly mention them. And maybe during the Q&A, I can explain a little, a little bit more on these different views. Mid-tribulation... Partial rapture, pre-wrath rapture, post-tribulation, and pre-tribulation. What I am teaching to you right now is pre-tribulation. That the rapture will take place before the tribulation period comes, removing the church from the entire seven years of tribulation. Another proof for the imminence of the rapture is the fact that apostles thought we're already apostles thought that we are already living in the last hour or last days. First John 2 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is present tense the last hour. 
Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, God has in these last days spoken to us by design, meaning the countdown of the second coming of Christ began in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven. If they were already living in the last days, more so in our time right now, right? Dr. John Walbord, a former president of Dallas Theological Seminary, he is known for his books on end-time events. He has a frame inside this office with this inscription, perhaps today, perhaps today. Beloved in the Lord, when was the last time you thought that it is perhaps today? Another proof is the, the fact that New Testament believers were already eagerly waiting for the revealing of the Son, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly waiting for reasons why we need to value the, the rapture. First, the rapture is important. We must know it. Second, the rapture is incredible. We must be excited for it. Third, the rapture is imminent. We must be prepared for it. And the last, this is more of the, the practical application for our sanctification of this end-time event. The rapture has imperatives. We must obey it's of it. The rapture has imperatives. We must obey each of it. There are four imperatives that I'm going to give you for this session. There are more, but I'll give you only four. First, the rapture is our blessed hope. We are commanded to be happy because of it. First Thessalonians 4.18 Therefore, comfort one another with his words. Encourage one another with his words. Help one another to be happy in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of crisis. Comfort one another with his words. Paul does not say that this truth should inspire and stimulate great debates, but comfort Continual comfort. And take note again, this is not a suggestion. This is rather a mandate. We need to use the truths of the rapture in comforting one another, in encouraging one another, in strengthening one another, in helping one another be happy, be joyful in the Lord continually. And Jesus Christ himself is our prime model in using these words to comfort others. He knew the disciples would be devastated with a sudden twist of events. On Tuesday of the week, he was crucified. They were all excited that Christ might already set up his earthly kingdom on Tuesday of the week that he was crucified. Then comes Thursday. Jesus made it's very clear that he will soon be gone. And so he used rapture truths to strengthen them. John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. This is a promise. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Beloved in the Lord, again, we need to strengthen our spiritual immune system because in this time of crisis, our number one enemy is sin and not COVID. So again, Drink vitamin R regularly. 
Second imperative. The rapture is glorious. We are commanded to live holy because of it. Open your Bibles in 1 John 3, 2 to 3. This is now a cross-reference of the rapture passage of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. This is rapture. For he shall see him, we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. The rapture truth should encourage us to pursue holiness. We are commanded to live holy because of it. First John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I hope when Jesus Christ comes tonight, this week, or whenever, we will be found faithful doing his will glorifying him into our lives we are in a right place doing things that are godly third imperative that i would like you to take note in relation to rapture the rapture is imminent we are commanded to be hard working because of it Open your Bibles in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Of course, the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the believers which will happen during the rapture. And because of all these glorious truths and because of the imminency of the rapture, what is the application? The last verse of that chapter, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be a hard-working Christian, always abounding in the Lord because of the rapture. Again, I would like to mention what Oswald J. Smith because always abounding here in the work of the Lord mainly refers, of course, in relation to God, it is loving God above all. In relation to others, it is helping them love God above all through the ministry of evangelism and disciple making. Through the ministry of one another inside the church and through the ministry of reaching out to the lost. That is our mission. This is the work that the Lord has entrusted to us. And he says always abound in the work of the Lord with or without COVID with or without pandemic healthy or sick preach the word in season or without season because we talk of the second coming my friend oswald j smith said half the world has never heard of the first the last one the last imperative that I'm going you to take note, based, still based on a rapture passage. The rapture, beloved in the Lord, is ultimately about our reunion with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are commanded to hold dear to it. Open your Bibles in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved his appearing, to those who hold dear to his appearing. Do you love the, the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you excited for the coming Christmas? I think there's no wrong celebrating Christmas. But beloved in the Lord, there's no crown of righteousness as a reward for those who love the first coming. 
the reward will be given for those who love the second coming, the second, the, the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christmas, the first coming, is the foundation of our hope. But the rupture, the second coming, is the fulfillment of our hope. And I believe as Christians, we should be more excited for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is why at the concluding section of Revelation 22, when Jesus Christ said, Surely I am coming quickly. The response of John the Beloved, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Beloved in the Lord, again, the rapture is our blessed hope. We are commanded to be happy because of it. The rapture is glorious. We are commanded to live holy because of it. The rapture is imminent. We are commanded to be hardworking because of it. The rapture is ultimately our union with Christ. We are commanded to hold dear to it. Four reasons why we need to value the rapture. The rapture is important. We must know it. The rapture is incredible. We must be excited for it. The rapture is imminent. We must be prepared for it. The rapture has imperatives. We must obey it of it. May God bless the lecture preaching of his word. Give you thanks, O oh Father God. In Christ's name. Amen.